Hey everyone, today we are diving back into the world of vintage photography with this camera, the number 1A Pocket Kodak. This camera comes from between about 1926 to 1932, and it is a folding style camera with bellows, which makes it a reasonably compact size for carrying around. So let's look at how it works and see what it can do. To use this camera, you open this latch right here, and that pops door, the door open, which you can then open like this. Once you're here, this standard with the lens slides forward. And latches right here onto the focusing rail. If you haven't seen my video where I replaced the bellows on this camera, I invite you to go check that out. So once the standard is out and locked into place, you can focus the camera by rotating this screw right here, which moves this standard forwards and backwards according to this focusing scale. From about 100 feet to six feet. You don't get to see the image through the lens. There is no viewfinder that's connected to the lens, like on modern cameras. Instead, you look through what was called the brilliant viewfinder, this, which is basically a, just a prism that you look down through the top and you see what's in front of this lens. So the image is not exactly the same. That's why you have to focus by distance according to this scale. Another thing about this front um, end of this camera is this right here which says Kodak on it handily, and is a stand. That stand allows you to set it down so that it is level. If I can demonstrate vertically, it does this so that the camera will sit level in portrait orientation. If instead you want uh, landscape orientation, there is another little stand right here that you can flip out that allows it to stand level in a horizontal fashion. So you can see, if I use my box, that's what allows it to sit level horizontally. There are mounting points for tripods here, so you can do a vertical orientation, and here for a horizontal orientation. And you'll notice that there is a little stylus right here that we'll get to later. In terms of the normal controls for a camera, you'll notice there is a shutter and an aperture, as usual. The shutter speed can be 1 50th of a second, 1 25th, bulb, and timed. So it's a leaf shutter inside the lens. That trips 1 50th. That trips 1 25th. And if you can see it, the bulb setting will stay open. I don't know if I can get an angle where you can see that on the camera. Yeah, you can see it stays open as long as you hold. And the time setting opens and stays open until you press it again. The aperture range for this particular lens is from about 7.9, according to this scale, to f45. So that's pretty much it for the controls on this camera. Traditionally, it would have used rather slow black and white orthochromatic film, hence the slow shutter speeds. There's a spot here on the shutter also where you could use a um, cable release. So you could screw a cable release in there and press it so that you're not touching the camera. This is a rather slow shutter speed for a large image size and a rather long focal length. So this is about a hundred millimeter focal length, if I'm not mistaken. And um, it is a two and a half by four and a quarter inch negative size. The viewfinder, which you can look through, you can see, there's my hand, will rotate so that if you're in the landscape format, you can also see through there, looking down at the camera. To 
close this this camera up, you rotate the Brilliant Viewfinder up, release this from the focusing rail right here with this notch, so press that, and then that slides back in, collapsing the bellows. Then you press these two bars here to release them, and it closes back up. The only other controls on the outside of here are the Film Advance which will only turn in one direction to remind you not to go the wrong way. And then on the back, we have a red window, which originally was intended to show you the frame number so that it would have paper backing and it would show you a marking for one, two, three, etc., for the film. So you could see that through the window. And that was not a problem for this camera and exposing the, the film to light because it's a red filter and it used orthochromatic black and white film, which is not sensitive to red light. And it was also typically ISO 25 there, thereabouts at the time, maybe 50. The other thing you'll see here, right here is a little window that you could use that stylus I showed you to open. And that would give you access to the back of the film, which was autographic 116 film. So this had backing on it where you could open this window, you could see the back of the film and you could use that stylus to scratch notes on it, leave it exposed to the sunlight for a minute or so, and that would give you a written message that's actually embedded in the film once you develop it. Autographic film isn't available anymore, so we won't be using that. We'll just be keeping it closed. Orthochromatic film is still available, though I don't currently have any. I have, at the moment, Milford HP 5 Plus, black and white, which is a panchromatic film, so in order to use panchromatic film, I'm going to have to cover this with black tape. Now let's look inside. So in order to load the film, you can see this is a metal box and there's no seams that you can open up on the back. So the way you load this is from the front. You take this out and you slide that gate right there, wiggle this a little bit, lift it up, and then wiggle it out of this side. And this whole assembly with the lens and the bellows and everything lifts out, leaving you with the film chamber. So the film goes in this side, rolls across to the take-up spool on this side, and I still have the original take-up spool in here. I can get it out. Got to do that. It's a little fiddly. There's the original 116 take-up spool. And in comparison, here is a 120 take-up spool. They are not quite the same size. So 116 film is 70 millimeters in width, whereas 120 film is 63 millimeters in width. 120 film is still available, 116 film is not available anymore. So what we need to do in order to use 120 film is, an, is use an adapter. Fortunately, the fine folks at Film Photography Project have made such a thing. So I bought one. And this comes with a spool, first of all, and these adapter pieces. It comes with two sets of these that plug into the ends of your 120 roll film. For a lot of cameras, that's all you need, just the spacers to put it in place. This camera does not have, I don't know if you can see that inside, there is no centering pin on this side of the spool, nor are there any centering pins on the supply side of the spool. So these discs at the ends of the spool are what keep it centered. So that has to be the right size for the spool to work. Fortunately, the folks at Film Photography Project have included these, which snap over the ends of here like that, so that it will center properly and roll. Now these don't fit perfectly, so what I have done is I have taken the other set of these and I have super glued the spacers in place so that they won't fall off. That enables me to put this as a take-up spool for 120 film. I can use the original, um, but then the spacing may not be quite right and 
if there's a gap on that side, when I take it out, it may fog. So I may have to remove the film inside a bag. But anyway, I can use a 120 film like this. If I put it the right way around, I can slide it in there and get the pin oriented properly. There. And then it will rotate so that I can spool the film. And I can pull that out again and take it out. So once you've got the film in place, this slides back in, locks down, and then this frame, two and a half by four and a quarter inches, is the image size. One other thing that you'll notice with this is that the 120 film is not quite wide enough to cover that gap. So I may need to make a template to narrow it just a little bit. One challenge that we will face with this camera is that because we don't have the advantage of the viewfinder anymore, because the original film kind is not available, there is no way to tell where the film is from outside while it's closed up. Also, there are no detentes on this film wind, so it just turns and turns and turns and turns. So in order to advance the film the right amount without overlapping frames or wasting film, we have to estimate how many turns does it take to move one frame. So I've done the math on this. We need three full turns of the winder in order to advance the film one frame with a little bit of gap for safety. What that means for 120 film is that on a roll of 120 film, such as this Ilford HP5 Plus, I can only get five full frames uh, and there'll be a little bit of wasted film out in there as well. Gaps in between and at the end. But it's not quite long enough to get six safely. So, $2 a shot for the film, woohoo. But, um, that's what we got to do to make it work. Next time, I will actually load it with film and we'll take it for a spin to try to take some pictures with it.